about a dozen of you left, just like the, the disciples Jesus had. <laughs> Praise God. Glad you all are here. I want to read today passage Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Will you please stand for the reading of the word? Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Let us focus our attention on you and your word and how that applies to us today and every day. Amen. Well, the next several weeks, we'll be talking about living out our faith authentically by the things that we do. These will be good reminders of how we need to live to be pleasing to our Lord, even in fact, as you all are doing. So the series is how not to be a hypocrite. And today it's how not to be a hypocrite when giving. This morning, we're going to learn how our faith is lived out before others by our giving. Next week, we will learn how our faith is lived out before God by our praying. And after that, the last part, we will learn how our faith is lived out in relationship to ourselves by fasting. These will be good reminders of Christian disciplines that, we, that every Christian is practicing. And if you're not, this is a good reminder of what you need to be doing. This is what we are and who we are as Christians. Now, last time I gave a general overview of what Jesus says about hypocrisy beginning in verse 1. He said, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Remember what a hypocrite is. In the Greek, he was an actor who wore a mask with exaggerated expressions to dramatize the role he was playing. The term came to be used of anyone who pretended to be what they were not. Now we all struggle with that at times. That's the human condition. But if we're given over to consistent hypocrisy, then there's a problem, and this is the right place for us to be, to be reminded to live authentically. Now, the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day pretended to be what they were not. They practiced their religion for others to see. It was just to show. It was a mockery of what God desired when worshiping him. And when we do something for God, but want others to know about it, then we aren't really doing it for God. But there's a tension there, isn't there? Sometimes we need to let people know what we're doing so we can be prayed for. And there are other times, the Bible says, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. So there's a balance here. The focus here is when you're doing something for God solely to be seen by others to show how spiritual you are. The practicing of your faith is between you and God. It's not about what I think of you or the person you're sitting next to thinks of you. It's what God thinks of you that matters. We lose the approval of God when we seek the applause of people. You got that? That's pretty much it. And you know what? I don't think there's anyone in our congregation who's like this at all. Well, there's just one, but I'm not going to tell you who he is. It's me! No. We all struggle. But it's a good reminder again of what our motivations are. Righteousness before people to be noticed by them is called self-righteousness. And that doesn't help anybody. This is why Jesus is teaching about all of this now. He wants us to be true worshipers of him, authentic followers, real Christians. And let me ask you, is that your desire? To be a real Christian, a real believer in private and in practice? I'm sure it is. Warren Wearsby, the Bible teacher, said, a hypocrite is not a person 
who fails to reach his desired spiritual goals because all of us fail in one way or another. A hypocrite is a person who doesn't even try to reach any goals, but he makes people think that he has. His profession and his practice never meet. Someone wrote this little poem, Unless my talk about my faith is mirrored in my walk, the faith that proudly I profess is merely empty talk. Matthew 6, 2. So when you give to the needy, Notice Jesus says, when you give, not if. All Christians are givers. There is no such thing as a non-giving believer. We are to be the most generous with our time, our treasure, and our talent. God did not so richly give us all that we have just to hoard it, to keep it, to store it, and lock it away. He expects us to be channels of his blessings. We are his hands. We are his feet. We're even his wallet. Now the Jewish rabbis placed a great emphasis on charity and doing good deeds as a way of gaining God's favor. The Jewish apocryphal book said things like this. And this is important for you to know the context of why Jesus is saying this. Their book said, It is better to give to charity than to lay up gold, for charity will save a man from death. It will make amends for sin. Another one of those said, As water will quench a flaming fire, so charity will pay for sin. Ah, can you see their teaching was a little off? They felt they could buy their way into heaven. And as a result of that wrong-headed teaching... They believed that they could buy their way in to God's favor by helping out the poor. They naturally thought that it was easier for a rich man to obtain salvation because he could give more. Isn't that amazing how topsy-turvy these religious leaders were? They believed they could make it to heaven. The richer you were, the more guaranteed that you were. This is probably the reason why Jesus came and said this. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? How Jesus came and flipped it around again on them. Yeah, you think you're rich, you're going to make it to heaven? No. No. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And he's using great hyperbole. So what does that apply? Does that apply today? Does anyone believe that? Yes, the Catholics do. The Catholics do. This type of belief is still around today. Traditional Roman Catholic teaching says the same thing. Pope Leo the Great in the 5th century said this, By prayer we seek to appease God. By fasting we extinguish the lust of the flesh. Let me tell you, I fasted. It does not get rid of the lust of the flesh. And by, listen, and by doing good deeds we redeem our sins. If you don't understand that about the Catholic faith, it's a mixture of faith and works together. You aren't saved unless you do both. Protestant Christianity says it's faith alone, through Christ alone, only. We do our good works as a result of us being saved. They do not combine. It's called, the phrase is called synchronicity. That is, we, we work with God. We work with him for our salvation. Synchronicity, that isn't it. What we believe is monergism. Okay, you're writing this down, right? Monergism. It's God alone. Mono. Okay? So this is still, it still plays out today. Even the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they have to work out their salvation this way to get salvation. On Saturdays, it's called Pioneering Day. That's why you want to keep your doors locked and your windows shut when you hear that knock on the door because they're knocking to work on their salvation. The Mormons believe the same thing. You have to work for your salvation. Protestants, true Orthodox Protest Protestantism is this. Grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. Okay? And it's actually for God alone, by his word alone. It's called the five solas. Five things only. It's all Christ. Now, just a reminder. No good deed, no amount of money, no act of charity can ever take away our sin. 
Only the good work that Christ performed on the cross can do that. That's the only work that matters is what he did on the cross. And with that in mind, you can see why the religious leaders wanted everyone to know when they gave to the poor. They believed that when they gave in secret, listen, when they gave in secret, they believed all benefit from giving was lost. The only way they could gain any favor from God was if they gave before an audience. Isn't that crazy? I think it is. Matthew, the whole verse, verse 2. So let me re-up, re-up this again. The religious leaders believe they did it publicly for everyone to see they got salvation. Christ comes and says, no, no, you don't do that. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. If you do something for what for others' benefit and attention, there you got it. You might as well just not give the money or do the act because, well, do the act because you're still helping somebody, but if you're doing it for others, no one cares, really, and God certainly doesn't. Now, there is no historical record of trumpets actually being blown. This, too, is hyperbole when they gave, but this might be where we got the phrase, tooting his own horn, okay? Okay. Now what happened is the receptacles that were around the temple, there were 13 of them, they had a box and they had a funnel that looked like a trumpet. It kind of looked like an old Victrola. You know the old kind of, do you guys know what I'm talking about, an old Victrola? You know what a Victrola is? It's like a record player and it had a big horn on it. I mean, Joe and Bill have one. Um, (laughs) And so that's kind of what it looked like. There's a big horn and they put their money in the little horn. So Jesus is exaggerating to make a point that the leaders gave to show off, to show how righteous they were. And this is what they did. These hypocrites would show off by exchanging their money beforehand, and they'd get as many coins as possible so their pockets would be bulging with the coins, and they'd walk throughout the temple, and they would toss their coins into those 13 receptacles to make as loud a noise as possible, right? Have you ever seen a kid put something in a can Have they ever done anything quietly in their life? No. If we gave something to Santiago or Diego and said, put that coin in the offering plate quietly, I guarantee it, Liberty Lighthouse would hear them doing it. It's like this. If we took a $100 bill to the bank before the offering time and we exchanged it for rolls of pennies, then when you go up to the offering plates, you take them and you slam them into the offering plates to make sure everybody knows that you're giving. Everyone would notice and everyone would think you're giving a lot and they'd go, ooh, wow. Now, if you give loudly, you may get your name in the paper or you may have a wing of a building named after you. Some churches even put your name on a seat if you give enough. Do you know that? Have you ever seen that? <laughs> it's some of the old time churches, right? You get the aisle seat in the middle or probably you get the back seat because everyone wants to sit in the back. No, I'll put your name on the seat if you sit in the front. I'll just do it and you don't have to pay anything, okay? So let me ask you this. How is your giving? Do you give to get recognized or maybe not that or out of a sense of duty? Or do you give for the tax deduction. All those are wrong motives. Or are you giving from the heart? Is your heart in the right place when you give? What do you think would happen if they took away the tax deduction? Which, if, if, if people get elected, trust me, it's only going to be a several years before the churches lose that great benefit. You know what? I'm going to tell you it wouldn't affect me. It's great to get the tax deduction. That ain't why I'm doing it, Right? And I'm sure most of you aren't doing it. It's nice to get the tax deduction. Don't get me wrong. But if they took that away, would that affect your giving? If you love the Lord and you're giving with the right spirit and the right heart, it's not going to affect your giving at all. Okay, we lost that. Okay. Mark Twain's wife was tired of his cursing. So she tried to shock him into quitting by letting out a long string of curse words. Twain said, honey... You got all the words right, but your heart isn't in it. (laughs) It has to do with the heart. Now, you may be giving, but is it because you love God? What is your motive? 
do you see it as an, you know, worship isn't, that's the one thing I do miss is that we don't get to do it as an act of worship, but we do take that time for you to reflect on your giving. And if you're not prepared, you can prepare. And now we give it at the end of service as you're leaving or when you come in whenever you want to. But I did that because it was an act of worship. That's why we did it. It isn't so everyone could see you giving. In fact, I, when I sat up here, I tried to turn away so I wouldn't look at who's giving and who wasn't. But anyway, we're doing it the way we're doing it now, right? Do you see it as an act of worship? If you aren't giving at all, what do you think that says about your faith? Jesus himself says, where your treasure is, there your heart is as well. So if you don't give anything at all, there's your heart. There's your heart. I read about a pastor who wouldn't violate his convictions to marry a believer to an unbeliever. I too have that same conviction. I'll marry two unbelievers and I'll marry two believers, but I'll never marry an unbeliever and a believer. But his decision affected a very wealthy lady who gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to the church. She told the pastor that if he refused to perform this wedding, then she was leaving and taking her money with her. He stuck to his guns and let her leave because her entire motive for giving was not out of a desire to honor the Lord, but to gain something from it. Her heart was not in the right place. Jesus says that when we give to impress others, we have our reward in full. So how are we to give then? Verses 3 and 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let me give you another thing here. You know, I think giving just so God rewards you is probably also the wrong motive. Does that make sense? The main motive at all for giving at all is because you love Jesus, and that's it. Now, it's a benefit to get the tax deduction. It's a benefit to get the reward from God. But it all starts with the heart, which is why we have this time that we sing the song, we sing a hymn, we pray, we think, we put our mind there. Lord, thank you for all you've given to me. Thank you for the privilege of giving to you. Some of you may give because you have a set amount. You're going to give your 10% and you give it to the penny. That's fine. Some of you may say, I'm going to give 15% this week. Some of you may not say anything at all, but you're just going to give because you know what? I'm going to give this amount. It's your heart that matters. And if you don't know this, I'm going to tell you again, it's important that you know, I don't know who gives. I do that on purpose. I do that so I don't accidentally favor somebody else over another or look down on somebody who doesn't. Does that make sense? I don't know who gives. I do ask how our offering is doing, but I don't. I've never had to, cook, to talk on offerings in our church for five years because we didn't have enough. Did you know that? I've only taught on it when we came to it in Scripture. And that says a lot about all of you. It says all a lot about your love for God. Our church in California, right before the pastor went on sabbatical in the summer, he'd always do a series on giving. Why? Because when the pastor wasn't there, the people didn't go to church, and they didn't give, and our income went down. In fact, most Christian ministries, their income goes down in the summer. It's as if they take the summer off from Christ, and there's no such thing. You give, not because you have to, not because the pastor is telling you to, but because you want to, because you love the Lord. A pastor told of a dear old lady who followed the progress of the church from its early days. When it came time to build a new building and furnishing it, she sent a sizable gift to purchase a desk, chairs, and office equipment. The pastor was overwhelmed with her generosity, especially since she did not even live in their community. This is what she told him. This is our little secret. She wanted no recognition or applause or a plaque commemorating her generosity. She just found great joy in being able to give as to the Lord for the work of ministry. Her left hand did not know what her right hand was doing, in other words. To not let your left hand know what the right hand is doing is giving spontaneously without any big show or any special effort. Giving to help others should be the normal action for a believer. 
and to do it simply, directly, and discreetly is a practice God will bless. I read about Charles Spurgeon and his wife Susanna. They would sell the eggs their chickens laid, but refused to give away. They refused to give away the eggs. Even close relatives were told, you may have them if you pay for them. As a result, some people labeled the Spurgeons as greedy. They accepted the criticisms without even defending themselves. It was only after Mrs. Spurgeon died that the full story was revealed. All the profits from the sale of their eggs went to support two elderly widows. So they endured the shame, they endured the gossip for a greater cause. So now you know what Logan's doing with all the money you give him for his eggs. Logan goes, <laughs> because the Spurgeons were unwilling to let their left hand know what the right hand was doing, they endured those personal attacks in silence, and that's commendable. John MacArthur said, Pastor John MacArthur, the most satisfying giving and the giving that God blesses is that which is done and forgotten. I'm very glad, very glad <laughs> by this sermon that we did move the offering plate though to the back, <laughs> okay? Because then I'd have to say, ah, oh, yeah, okay. And this is, you know what's kind of interesting? You know what's really interesting if you didn't know? Our offerings went up during COVID. When it started in March, for the next six months, our offerings went up when we didn't meet, we didn't pass the plate, we met in our cars, and when we moved that to the back. Isn't that funny? Now they kind of like stable out again, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Joe to take the offering and put it in the closet and see what happens. What do you think? So I just thought that was kind of neat. It was a nice lesson for me to see that. We didn't plan it that way. We just did it because of COVID. But now I guess this is where it's at. It's at the back, right? Can we put a light on it, Joe? Like a flashing light? Okay. We are constantly bombarded as Christians with appeals to give money, are we not? Some are good causes, many others are not, like helping to finance a jet for televangelist Creflo Dollar. He needs a jet for his ministry. What a bunch of... <laughs> and the others. Christians are to give regularly and with purpose to their local church first. But we are also to give to those in need when there's an opportunity and we have the ability to help. You understand that? There's going to be more when we talk in a couple, in a couple of months about that. But you give to the local church first. Why? Because our, our finances go to help our congregation and our community. Uh, we help, we give generously. I'm telling you what you, we all give and this is okay because you've all given, we go to support Young Life Ministry. Uh, we give that because we don't have a youth ministry. We give to people in our church in need, and we give to people outside of our church in need. But that's what that's for. It starts here. And then after you give to your local church, you give to other ministries. And then you decide where you want to give, what you want to do. You pray about it. You decide what are the causes that are near to your heart. This has always characterized God's people, by the way. God doesn't need our giving. You know that, right? But he uses it to bless others through us. And there's a cycle of blessing that's described in the Bible. Do you know about the cycle of blessing? Proverbs 11.25 says, A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. When we give, God blesses. And when he blesses us, we give out of the abundance that God gives us. So we give, we give out, and God gives more. I can just tell you this subtly, that it's been absolutely proven in my life. It's been absolutely proven in my life. But my, I, I've been in debt, and I've kept giving, and God has blessed me, and I've gotten out of debt. And he's given more than I've ever expected. And that's where I stand today. I am richly, richly blessed. And you know what? It takes a discipline. Parents, if you have some kids and they haven't started giving yet, you need to train them now because then they'll know when they get older to give because when you're an adult and you come to the Lord and you haven't given, it's hard to start saying, oh gosh, we can't budget it. Let me tell you this. You can't afford not to budget that. 
And here's the way you do it. First, 10, let's just say start with 10%. By the way, I say start. You're not given, you're not limited to 10% and you don't have to give 10%. You can start with 10%. But you set that aside first thing. Do you think it's off the gross or off the net? What do you think? Huh? The gross. What does the government get? Does the government get their taxes off the net or the gross? Right? You do that, you start that, and watch what happens. Now, you don't give to get. You don't go, I'm going to give 100, I'm going to get 10,000. No, you give, and God will richly bless you in other ways. Sometimes financially, sometimes spiritually. You'll be amazed what happens as you start. Now, if you don't want to start with 10%, start with whatever. But let me tell you, for your own benefit, Christian, start giving. For your own benefit. I've already told you, we don't need it, I don't need it, God doesn't need it. You need to give. I'm telling you this for your benefit, because I only want the best for you. And again, I don't know who's not giving or giving, so I'm looking at you, okay, don't think I'm going, ooh, he's looking at me. No, I don't know if you give or not give, okay? So I'm going to look at every one of you. You all need to give, so you'll be blessed, okay? Trust me, it's absolutely true, absolutely true. Luke, Jesus says this, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down and shaken together, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Did I get that right? Oh, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. That's like you get, you ever get a box of cereal and it's a big box? Where's the cereal at? The cereal's like half, isn't it? You get the big box and the cereal's, it's all settled. Well, what he's saying here is like you get that big box, you shake it down, it's halfway, and you pour more in, you shake it down, you pour more in, you're shoving it down, and it's pouring over. That's what God will do in your life. This doesn't just apply to giving money, by the way, but to every type of giving that is done sincerely before the Lord and meets a need. When we give in secret with love and without a claim or expectation of recognition, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Listen to this. If we remember, God will forget. But if we forget, God will remember. God will not miss handing out one single reward to his faithful followers. We ought to be willing, as people who have been given everything by a generous God, not to mention salvation, to meet every need possible. He's given us everything we need. And then we just leave the accounting to him because he's faithful. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I am blessed and we are blessed and we know you. And we are blessed that we can give. We are blessed that you give back and you give us the opportunity to give to others. I thank you for your great circle of blessing. I thank you that you have provided everything we need here in our church. I am thankful for your hand of protection over our congregation. I am thankful, Lord, for Jesus. I am thankful that, God, you gave your very best. You gave yourself. You gave your son. And he gave it all. He gave his life. And that's all you ask of us is to do the same for you, for others. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.